the general propaganda which would best serve psychopolitics would be a continual insistence that certain authoritative levels of healing deemed this or that the correct treatment of insanity. These treatments must always include a certain amount of brutality. Propaganda should continue and stress the rising incidence of insanity in a country. The entire field of human behavior for the benefit of the country can, at length, be broadened into abnormal behavior. Thus, anyone indulging in any eccentricity, particularly the eccentricity of combating psychopolitics, could be silenced by the authoritative opinion on the part of a psychopolitical operative that he was acting in an abnormal fashion. This, with some good fortune, could bring the person into the hands of the psychopolitical operative so as to ever f so as to forevermore disable him or to swerve his loyalties by pain drug hypnotism. On the subject of obedience itself, the most optimum obedience is unthinking obedience. The command given must be obeyed without any rationalizing on the part of the subject. The command must therefore be implanted below the thinking processes of the subject to be influenced and must react upon him in such a way as to bring no mental alertness on his part. It is in the interest of psychopolitics that a population be told that an hypnotized person will not do anything against his actual will, will not commit immoral acts, and will not act so as to endanger himself. While this may be true of light parlor hypnotism, it certainly is not true of commands implanted with the use of electric shock, drugs, or heavy punishment. It is counted upon completely that this will be discredited to the general public by psychopolitical operatives, for if it were to be generally known that individuals would obey commands harmful to themselves and would commit immoral acts while under the influence of deep hypnotic commands, the actions of many people, working unknowingly in favor of communism, would be too well understood." People acting under deep hypnotic commands should be acting apparently of their own volition and out of their own convictions. The entire subject of psychopolitical hypnosis, psychopolitics in general, defends for its defense upon continuous protest from authoritative sources that such things are not possible. And should anyone unmask a psychopolitical operative, he should at once declare the whole thing a physical impossibility and use his authoritative position to discount any accusation. Should any writings of psychopolitics come to view, it is only necessary to brand them a hoax and laugh them out of countenance. Thus, psychopolitical activities are easy to defend. When psychopolitical activities have reached a certain peak, from there on it is almost impossible to undo them, for the population is already under the duress of obedience to the psychopolitical operatives and their dupes. The ingredient of obedience is important, for the complete belief in the psychopolitical operative renders his statement cancelling any challenges about psychopolitical operations irrefutable. The optimum circumstances would be to occupy every position which would be consulted by officials on any question or suspicion arising on the subject of psychopolitics. Thus, a psychiatric advisor should be placed near to hand in every government operation. As all suspicions would then be referred to him, no action would ever be taken, and the goal of communism could be realized in that nation. Psychopolitics depends from the position of the layman upon its fantastic aspects. These are its best defense, but above all these defenses is implicit obedience on the part of officials and the general public because of the character of the psychopolitical operative in the field of healing. Chapter 7. Anatomy of Stimulus Response Mechanisms of man. 
Man is a stimulus response animal. His entire reasoning capabilities, even his ethics and morals, depend upon stimulus response machinery. This has long been demonstrated by such Russians as Pavlov, and the principles have long been used in handling the recalcitrant, in training children, and in bringing about a state of optimum behavior on the part of a population. Having no independent will of his own, man is easily handled by stimulus response mechanisms. It is only necessary to install a stimulus into the mental anatomy of man to have that stimulus reactivate and respond any time an exterior command source calls it into being. The mechanisms of stimulus response are easily understood. The body takes pictures of every action in the environment around an individual. When the environment includes brutality, shock, terror, and other such activities, the mental image picture gained contains in itself all the ingredients of the environment. If the individual himself was injured during that moment, the injury itself will manifest when called upon to respond by an exterior command source. As an example of this, if an individual is beaten and is told during the entirety of the beating that he must obey certain officials, he will in the future feel the beginnings of the pain the moment he begins to disobey. The installed pain itself reacts as a policeman, for the experience of the individual demonstrates to him that he cannot combat and will receive pain from certain officials. The mind can become very complex in its stimulus responses. As easily demonstrated in hypnotism, an entire chain of commands having to do with a great many complex actions can be beaten, shocked, or terrorized into a mind and will there lie dormant until called into view by some similarity in the circumstances of the environment to the incident of punishment. The stimulus we call the, quote, incident of punishment, unquote, where the response mechanism need only contain some small part of the stimulus to call into view the mental image picture and cause it to exert against the body the pain sequence. So long as the individual obeys the picture or follows the commands of the stimulus implantation, he is free from pain. The behavior of children is regulated in this fashion in every civilized country. The father, finding himself unable to bring about immediate obedience and training on the part of his child, resorts to physical violence, and after administering punishment of a physical nature to the child on several occasions, is gratified to experience complete obedience on the part of the child each time the father speaks. In that parents are wont to be lenient with their children, they seldom administer sufficient punishment to bring about entirely optimum obedience. The ability of the organism to withstand punishment is very great. Complete and implicit response can be gained only by stimuli sufficiently brutal to actually injure the organism. The Cossack method of breaking wild horses is a useful example. The horse will not restrain itself or take any of its rider's commands. The rider, wishing to break it, mounts and takes a flask of strong vodka and smashes it between the horse's ears. The horse, struck to its knees, its eyes filled with alcohol, mistaking the dampness for blood, instantly and thereafter gives its attention to the rider and never needs further breaking. Difficulty in breaking horses is only occasioned when light punishments are administered. There is some mawkish sentiment about, quote, breaking the spirit, unquote. But what is desired here is an obedient horse, and sufficient brutality brings about an obedient horse. The stimulus response mechanisms of the body are such that the pain and the command subdivide so as to counter each other. The mental image picture of the punishment will not become effective upon the individual unless the command content is disobeyed. It is pointed out in many early Russian writings that this is a survival mechanism. It has already been well and thoroughly used in the survival of communism. It is only necessary to deliver into the organism a sufficient stimulus to gain an adequate response. So long as the organism obeys the stimulus 
Whenever it is re-stimulated in the future, it does not suffer from the pain of the stimulus. But should it disobey the command content of the stimulus, the stimulus reacts to punish the individual. Thus, we have an optimum circumstance and one of the basic principles of psychopolitics. A sufficiently installed stimulus will thereafter remain as a police mechanism within the individual to cause him to follow the commands and directions given to him. Should he fail to follow these commands and directions, the stimulus mechanism will go into action. As the commands are there with the moment of duress, the commands themselves need never be repeated. And if the individual were to depart thousands of miles away from the psychopolitical operative, or himself become extremely ill and in agony, these principles built from the earliest days of Pavlov, by constant and continuous Russian development, have at last become of enormous use to us in our conquest. For less modern and well-informed countries of earth lacking this mechanism, failing to understand it and coaxed into somnolence by our own psychopolitical operatives who discount and disclaim it, cannot avoid succumbing to it. The body is less able to resist a stimulus if it has insufficient food and is weary. Therefore, it is necessary uh, to administer all such stimuli to individuals when their ability to resist has been reduced by privation and exhaustion. Refusal to let them sleep over many days, denying them adequate food, then brings about an optimum state for the receipt of a stimulus. If a person is then given an electrical shock and is told while the shock is in action that he must obey and do certain things, he has no choice but to do them or to re-experience, because of his mental image picture of it, the electric shock. This highly scientific and intensely workable mechanism cannot be overestimated in the practice of psychopolitics. Drugging the individual produces an artificial exhaustion, and if he is drugged or shocked and beaten, and given a string of commands, his loyalties themselves can be definitely rearranged. This is PDH, or pain drug hypnosis. The psychopolitical operative in training should be thoroughly studied in the subject of hypnotism and post-hypnotic suggestion. He should pay particular attention uh, to the forgotten mechanism aspect of hypnotism, which is to say implantation in the unconscious mind. He should note particularly that a person given a command in an hypnotic state and then told when still in that condition to forget it will execute it on a stimulus response signal in the environment after he has awakened from his hypnotic trance. Having mastered these details fully, he should, by practicing upon criminals and prisoners or inmates available to him, produce the hypnotic trance by drugs and drive home post-hypnotic suggestions by pain administered to the drugged person. He should then study the reactions of the person when awakened, unquote, and should give him the stimulus response signal which would throw into action the commands given while in a drugged state of duress. By much practice he can then learn the threshold dosages of various drugs and the amount of duress in terms of electric shock or additional drug shock necessary to produce the optimum obedience to commands. He should also satisfy himself that there is no possible method known to man, there must be no possible method known to man, of bringing the patient into awareness of what has happened to him, keeping him in a state of obedience and response while ignorant of its cause. Using criminals and prisoners, the psychopolitical operative in training should then experiment with duress in the absence of privation, administering electric shocks, beatings, and terror-inducing tactics accompanied by the same mechanisms as those employed in hypnotism, and watch the conduct of the person when no longer under duress. 
The operative in training should carefully remark those who show a tendency to protest so that he may recognize possible recovery of memory of the commands implanted. Purely for his own education, he should then satisfy himself as to the efficacy of brain surgery in disabling the non-responsive prisoner. The boldness of the psychopolitical operative can be increased markedly by permitting persons who have been given pain drug hypnosis and who have demonstrated symptoms of rebelling or recalling into the society to observe how the label of insanity discredits and discounts the statements of the person. Exercises in bringing about insanity seizures at will simply by demonstrating a signal to persons upon whom pain drug hypnosis has been used and exercises in making the seizures come about through talking to certain persons in certain places and times should also be used. Brain surgery, as developed in Russia, should also be practiced by the psychopolitical operative in training to give him full confidence in, one, the crudeness with which it can be done, two, the certainty of erasure of the stimulus response mechanism itself, three, the production of imbecility, idiocy, and discoordination on the part of the patient, and Four, the small amount of comment which casualties in brain surgery occasion. Exercises in sexual attack on the patients should be practiced by the psychopolitical operative to demonstrate the inability of the patient under pain drug hypnosis to recall the attack, while indoctrinating a lust for further sexual activity on the part of the patient. Sex, in all animals, is a powerful motivator and is no less so in the animal man, and the occasioning of sexual liaison between females of a target family and indicated males, under the control of the psychopolitical operative, must be demonstrated to be possible with complete security for the psychopolitical operative, thus giving into his hands an excellent weapon for the breaking down of familial relations and consequent public disgraces for the psychopolitical target. Just as a dog can be trained, so can a man be trained. Just as a horse can be trained, so can a man be trained. Sexual lust, masochism, and any other desirable perversion can be induced by pain drug hypnosis and the benefit of psychopolitics. The changes of loyalties, allegiances, and sources of command can be occasioned easily by psychopolitical technologies, and these should be practiced and understood by the psychopolitical operative before he begins to tamper with psychopolitical targets of magnitude. The actual simplicity of the subject of pain drug hypnosis the use of electric shock, drugs, insanity-producing injections, and other materials should be masked entirely by technical nomenclature, the protest of benefit to the patient, by an authoritarian pose and position, and by carefully cultivating governmental positions in the country to be conquered. Although the psychopolitical operative working in universities where he can direct the curricula of psychology classes is often tempted to teach some of the principles of psychopolitics to the susceptible students in the psychology classes, he must be thoroughly enjoined to limit his information in psychology classes to the transmittal of the tenets of communism under the guise of psychology and must limit his activities in bringing about a state of mind on the part of the students where they will accept communist tenets as those of their own action and as modern scientific principles. The psychological operative must not at any time educate students fully in stimulus response mechanisms and must not impart to them, save those who will become his fellow workers, the exact principles of psychopolitics. It is not necessary to do so, and it is dangerous. Chapter 8. Degradation, Shock, and Endurance 
Degradation and conquest are companions. In order to be conquered, a nation must be degraded, either by acts of war, by being overrun, or being forced into humiliating treaties of peace, or by the treatment of her populace under the armies of the conqueror. However, degradation can be accomplished much more insidiously and much more effectively by consistent and continual defamation. Defamation is the best and foremost weapon of psychopolitics on the broad field. Continual and constant degradation of national leaders, national institutions, national practices, and national heroes must be systematically carried out but this is the chief function of Communist Party members in general, not the psychopolitician. The realm of defamation and degradation of the psychopolitician is man himself. By attacking the character and morals of man himself, and by bringing about, through contamination of youth, a general degraded feeling, command of the populace is facilitated to a very mocked degree. There is a curve of degradation which leads downward to a point where the endurance of an individual is almost at end, and any sudden action toward him will place him in a state of shock. Similarly, a soldier held prisoner can be abused, denied, defamed, and degraded until the slightest motion on the part of his captors will cause him to flinch. Similarly, the slightest word on the part of his captors will cause him to obey or vary his loyalties and beliefs. Given sufficient degradation, a prisoner can be caused to murder his fellow countrymen in the same stockade. Experiments on German prisoners have lately demonstrated that only after 70 days of filthy food, little sleep, and nearly untenable quarters, that the least motion toward the prisoner would bring about a state of shock beyond his endurance." threshold, and would cause him to hypnotically receive anything said to him. Thus it is possible in an entire stockade of prisoners, to the number of thousands, to being about a state of complete servile obedience, and without the labor of personally addressing each one, to pervert their loyalties and implant in them adequate commands to ensure their future conduct, even when released to their own people. By lowering the endurance of a person, a group, or a nation, and by constant degradation and defamation, it is possible to induce thus a state of shock which will receive adequately any command given. The first thing to be degraded in any nation is the state of man himself. Nations which have high ethical tone are difficult to conquer. Their loyalties are hard to shake, their allegiance to their leaders is fanatical, and what they usually call their spiritual integrity cannot be violated by duress. It is not efficient to attack a nation in such a frame of mind. It is the basic purpose of psychopolitics to reduce that state of mind to a point where it can be ordered and enslaved. Thus, the first target is man himself. He must be degraded from a spiritual being to an animalistic reaction pattern. He must think of himself as an animal, capable only of animalistic reactions. He must no longer think of himself or of his fellows as capable of, quote, spiritual endurance, unquote, or nobility. The best approach toward degradation in its first stages is the propaganda of scientific approach to man. Man must be consistently demonstrated to be a mechanism without individuality, and it must be educated into a populace under attack that man's individualistic reactions are the product of mental derangement. The populace must be brought into the belief that every individual within it who rebels in any way, shape, or form against efforts and activities to enslave the whole must be considered to be a deranged person whose eccentricities are neurotic or insane, and who must have at once the treatment of a psychopolitician. An optimum condition in such a program of degradation would address itself to the military forces of the nation, and bring them rapidly away from any other belief than that the disobedient one must be subjected to mental treatment.
An enslavement of a population can fail only if these rebellious individuals are left to exert their individual influence upon their fellow citizens, sparking them into rebellion, calling into account their nobilities and freedoms. Unless these restless individuals are stamped out and given into the hands of psychopolitical operatives early in the conquest, there will be nothing but trouble as the conquest continues. The officials of the government, students, readers, partakers of entertainment, must all be indoctrinated, by whatever means, into the complete belief that the restless, the ambitions, the natural leaders are suffering from environmental maladjustments, which can only be healed by recourse to psychopolitical operatives in the guise of mental healers. By thus degrading the general belief in the status of man, it is relatively simple, with cooperation from the economic salience being driven into the country, to drive citizens apart, one from another, to bring about a question of the wisdom of their own government, and to cause them to actively beg for enslavement. The educational programs of psychopolitics must, at every hand, seek out the levels of youth who will become the leaders in the country's future and educate them into the belief of the animalistic nature of man. This must be made fashionable. They must be taught to frown upon ideas, upon individual endeavor. They must be taught, above all things, that the salvation of man is to be found only by his adjusting thoroughly to his environment. This educational program in the field of psychopolitics can best be followed by bringing about a compulsory training in some subjects such as psychology or other mental practice and ascertaining that each broad program of psychopolitical training be supervised by a psychiatrist who is a trained psychopolitical operative. As it seems in foreign nations that the church is the most ennobling influence, each and every branch and activity of each and every church must, one way or another, be discredited. Religion must become unfashionable by demonstrating broadly, through psychopolitical indoctrination, that the soul is non-existent and that man is an animal. The lying mechanisms of Christianity lead men to foolishly brave deeds. By teaching them that there is a life hereafter, the liability of courageous acts while living is thus lessened. The liability of any act must be markedly increased if a populace is to be obedient. Thus there must be no standing belief in the church, and the power of the church must be denied at every hand. The psychological operative, in his program of degradation, should at all times bring into question any family which is deeply religious, and should any neurosis or insanity be occasioned in that family, to blame and hold responsible their religious connections for the neurotic or psychotic condition. Religion must be made synonymous with neurosis and psychosis. People who are deeply religious would be held less and less responsible for their own sanity and should more and more be relegated to the ministrations of psychopolitical operatives. By perverting the institutions of a nation and bringing about a general degradation, by interfering with the economics of a nation to the degree that privation and depression come about, only minor shocks will be necessary to produce, on the populace as a whole, an obedient reaction or an hysteria. Thus, the mere threat of war, the mere threat of a aviation bombings could cause the population to sue instantly for peace. It is a long and arduous road for the psychopolitical operative to achieve this state of mind on the part of a whole nation, but no more than twenty or thirty years should be necessary in the entire program. Having to hand, as we do, weapons with which to accomplish this goal, Chapter 9. The Organization of Mental Health Campaigns Psychopolitical operatives should at all times be alert to the opportunity to organize, quote, for the betterment of the community, 
unquote, mental health clubs or groups. By thus inviting the cooperation of the population as a whole in mental health programs, the terrors of mental aberration can be disseminated throughout the populace. Furthermore, each one of these mental health groups, properly guided, can bring, at last, legislative pressure against the government to secure adequately the position of the psychopolitical operative and to obtain for him government grants and facilities, thus bringing a government to finance its own downfall. Mental health organizations must carefully delete from their ranks anyone actually proficient in the handling or treatment of mental health. Thus must be excluded priests, ministers, actually trained psychoanalysts, good hypnotists, or trained dianet dianeticists. These, with some cognizance on the subject of mental aberration and its treatment, and with some experience in observing the mentally deranged, if allowed frequency within institutions, and if permitted to receive literature, would, sooner or later, become suspicious of the activities engaged upon by the psychopolitical operative. These must be defamed and excluded as untrained, unskillful quacks or perpetrators of hoaxes. No mental health movements with actual goals of mental therapy should be continued in existence in any nation. For instance, the use of Chinese acupuncture in the treatment of mental and physical derangement must, in China, be stamped out and discredited thoroughly, as it has some efficacy, and, more importantly, its practitioners understand, through long conversation with it, many of the principles of actual mental health and aberration. In the field of mental health, the psychopolitician must occupy and continue to occupy through various arguments, the authoritative position on the subject. There is always the danger that problems of mental health may be resolved by some individual or group, which might then derange the program of the psychopolitical operative in his mental health clubs. City officials, socialites, and other unknowing individuals on the subject of mental health should be invited to full cooperation in the activity of mental health groups. But the entirety of this activity should be to finance better facilities for the psychopolitical practitioner. To these groups, it must be continually stressed that the entire subject of mental illness is so complex that none of them, certainly, could understand any part of it. Thus, the club should be kept on a social and financial level. Where groups interested in the health of the community have already been formed, they should be infiltrated and taken over, and if this is not possible, they should be discredited and debarred, and the officialdom of the area should be invited to stamp them out as dangerous. When an hostile group dedicated to mental health is discovered, the psychopolitician should have recourse to the mechanisms of peyote, mescaline, and later drugs which cause temporary insanity. He should send persons, preferably those well under his control, into the mental health group, whether Christian science or Dianetics or faith preachers, to demonstrate their abilities upon this new person. These, in demonstrating their abilities, will usually act with enthusiasm. Midway in the course of their treatment, a quiet injection of peyote, mescaline, or other drug, or an electric shock, will produce the symptoms of insanity in the patient which has been sent to the target group. The patient thus demonstrating momentary insanity should immediately be reported to the police and taken away to some area of incarceration managed by psychopolitical operatives, and so placed out of sight. Officialdom will thus come, to in, come into a belief that this group drives individuals insane by their practices, and the practices of the group will then be despised and prohibited by law. The value of a widespread mental health organization 
are manifest when one realizes that any government can be forced to provide facilities for psychopolitical operatives in the form of psychiatric wards in all hospitals. In national institutions totally in the hands of psychopolitical operatives and in the establishment of clinics where youth can be contacted and arranged more seemingly to the purposes of psychopolitics. Such groups form a political force which can then legalize any law or authority desired for the psychopolitical operative. The securing of authority over such mental health organizations is done mainly by appeal to education. A psychopolitical operative should make sure that these psychiatrists he controls, those psychologists whom he has under his orders, have been trained for an excessively long period of time. The longer this training period, which can be required, the safer the psychopolitical program, since no new group of practitioners can arise to disclose and dismay psychopolitical programs. Furthermore, the groups themselves cannot hope to obtain any full knowledge of the subject, not having behind them many, many years of intensive training. Vienna has been carefully maintained as the home of psychopolitics since it was the home of psychoanalysis, although our activities have long since dispersed any of the gains made by Freudian groups and have taken over these groups, the proximity of Vienna to Russia, where psychopolitics is operating abroad, and the necessity, quote, for further study, unquote, by psychopolitical operatives in the birthplace of psychoanalysis, makes periodic contacts with headquarters possible. Thus, the word psychoanalysis must be stressed at all times, and must be pretended to be a thorough part of the psychiatrist's training. Psychoanalysis has the very valuable possession of a vocabulary and a workability which is sufficiently poor to avoid recovery of psychopolitical implications. Psychoanalysis has the very valuable possession of a vocabulary and a workability which is sufficiently poor to avoid recovery of psychopolitical implantations. It can be made fashionable throughout mental health organizations and by learning its patter and by believing they see some of its phenomena, the members of mental health groups can believe themselves conversant with mental health. Because its stress is sex, it is itself an adequate defamation of character and serves the purposes of degradation well. Thus, in organizing mental health groups, the literature furnished such groups should be psychoanalytic in nature. If a group of persons interested in suppressing juvenile delinquency, in caring for the insane, and the promotion of psychopolitical operatives and their actions can be formed in every major city of a country under conquest, the success of a psychopolitical program is assured since these groups seem to represent a large segment of the population. By releasing continued propaganda on the subject of dope addiction, homosexuality, and depraved conduct on the part of the young, even the judges of a country can become suborned into reacting violently against the youth of the country, thus misaligning and aligning the support of youth. The communication lines of psychopolitics, if such mental health organizations can be well established, can thus run from its most prominent citizens to its government. It is not too much to hope that the influence of such groups could bring about a psychiatric ward in every hospital in the land, and psychiatrists in every company and regiment of the nation's army, and whole government institutes manned entirely by psychopolitical operatives, into which ailing government officials could be placed to the advantage of the psychopolitician. If a psychiatric ward could be established in every hospital in every city in a nation, it is certain that, at one time or another, every prominent citizen of that nation could come under the ministrations of psychopolitical operatives or their dupes. The validation of psychiatric position in the armed forces and security-minded institutions of the nation under conquest could bring about a flow and fund of information unlike any other program which could be conceived. 
if every pilot who flies a new plane could come under the questioning of a psychopolitical operative, if the compiler of every plan of military action could thus come under the review of psychopolitical operatives, the simplicity with which information can be extracted by the use of certain drugs without the after-knowledge of the soldier would entirely cripple any overt action toward communism. If the nation could be educated into turning over to psychopolitical operatives every recalcitrant every recalcitrant or rebellious soldier, it would lose its best fighters. Thus the advantage of mental health organizations can be seen, for these, by exerting an apparent public pressure against the government, can achieve these ends and goals. The financing of a psychopolitical operation is difficult unless it is done by the citizens and government. Although vast sums of money can be obtained from private patients and from relatives who wish persons put away, it is nevertheless difficult to obtain millions unless the government itself is cooperating. The cooperation of the government to obtain these vast sums of money is best obtained by the organization of mental health groups composed of leading citizens and who bring their lobbying abilities to bear against the nation's government. Thus can be financed many programs which might otherwise have to be laid aside by the psychopolitician. The psychopolitical operative should bend consistent and continual effort toward forming and continuing in action innumerable mental health groups. The psychopolitical operative should also spare no expense in smashing out of existence, by whatever means, any actual healing group such as that of acupuncture in China, such as Christian science, Dianetics and faith healing in the United States, such as Catholicism in Italy and Spain, and the practical psychological groups of England. Chapter 10. Conduct Under Fire the psychopolitician may well find himself under attack as an individual or a member of a group. He may be attacked as a communist through some leak in the organization, or he may be attacked for malpractice. He may be attacked by the families of people whom he has injured. In all cases, his conduct of the situation should be calm and aloof. He should have behind him the authority of many years of training, and he should have participated fully in the building of defenses in the field of insanity, which give him the only statement as to the conditions of the mind. If he has not done his work well, hostile feeling groups may expose an individual psychopolitician. These may call into question the efficacy of psychiatric treatment such as shock, drugs, and brain surgery. Therefore, the psychopolitical operative must have to hand innumerable documents which assert enormously encouraging figures on the subject of recovery by reason of shock, brain surgery, drugs, and general treatment. Not one of these cases cited need be real, but they should be documented and printed in such a fashion as to form excellent court evidence. When his allegiance is attached, the psychopolitical operative should explain his... When his allegiance is attacked, the psychopolitical operative should explain his connection with Vienna on the grounds that Vienna is the place of study for all important matters of the mind. More importantly, he should rule into scorn, by reason of his authority, the sanity of the person attacking him. And if the psychopolitical archives of the country are adequate, many defamatory data can be unearthed and presented as a rebuttal. Should anyone attempt to expose psychotherapy as a psychopolitical activity, the best defense is calling into question the sanity of the attacker. The next best defense is authority. The next best defense is a validation of psychiatric practices in terms of long and impressive figures. The next best defense is the actual removal of the attacker by giving him or them treatment sufficient to bring about a period of insanity for the duration of the trial. This, more than anything else, would discredit them, but it is dangerous to practice this in the extreme. 
Psychopolitics should avoid murder and violence unless it is done in the safety of the institution on persons who have been proven to be insane. Where institution debts appear to be unnecessary or to rise in unreasonable number, political capital might be made of this by city officials or legislature. If the psychopolitical operative has himself or if his group has done a thorough job, defamatory data concerning the person or connections of the would-be attacker should be on file, should be documented and should be used in such a way as to discourage the inquiry. After a period of indoctrination, a country will expect insanity to be met by psychopolitical violence. Psychopolitical activity should become the only recognized treatment for insanity. Indeed, this can be extended to such a length that it could be made illegal for electric shock and brain surgery to be omitted in the treatment of a patient. In order to defend psychopolitical activities, a great complexity should be made of psychiatric, psychoanalytic, and psychological technology. Any hearing should be burdened by terminology too difficult to be transcribed easily. A great deal should be made out of such terms as schizophrenia, paranoia, and other relatively undefinable states. Psychopolitical tests need not necessarily be in agreement one to another where they are available to the public. Various types of insanity should be characterized by difficult terms. The actual state should be made obscure, but by this verbiage it can be built into the court or investigating mind that a scientific approach exists Psychopolitical tests need not necessarily be in agreement one to another where they are available to the public. Various types of insanity should be characterized by difficult terms. The actual state should be made obscure, but by this verbiage it can be built into the court or investigating mind that a scientific approach exists and that it is too complex for him to understand. It is not to be imagined that a judge or a committee of investigation should inquire too deeply into the subject of insanity, since they, themselves, part of the indoctrinated masses, are already intimidated if the psychopolitical activity has caused itself to be well documented in terms of horror in magazines. In case of a hearing or trial, the terribleness of insanity itself, its threat to the society, should be exaggerated until the court or committee believes that the psychopolitical operative is vitally necessary in his post and should not be harassed for the activities of persons who are irrational. An immediate attack upon the sanity of the attacker before any possible hearing can take place is the very best defense. It should become well known that only the insane attack psychiatrists. Unquote. The byword should be built into the society that paranoia is a condition, quote, in which the individual believes he is being attacked by communists. It will be found that this defense is effective. Part of the effective defenses should include the entire lack in the society of any real psychotherapy. This must be systematically stamped out since a real psychotherapy might possibly uncover the results of psychopolitical activities. Jurisprudence in a capitalistic nation is of such clumsiness that cases are invariably tried in their newspapers. We have handled these things much better in Russia and have uniformly brought people to trial with full confessions already arrived at, being implanted, before the trial took place. Should any whisper or pamphlet against psychopolitical activities be published, it should be laughed into scorn, branded an immediate hoax, and its perpetrator or publisher should be at the first opportunity, branded as insane, and by the use of drugs, the insanity should be confirmed. Chapter 11. The Use of Psychopolitics in Spreading Communism Reactionary nations are of such a composition that they attack a word without understanding it, 
as the conquest of a nation by communism depends upon imbuing its population with communistic tenets, it is not necessary that the term communism be applied at first to the educative measures employed. As an example, in the United States, we have been able to alter the works of William James and others into a more acceptable pattern, and to place the tenets of Karl Marx, Pavlov, Lamarck, and the idea of dialectic materialism into the textbooks of psychology to such a degree that anyone thoroughly studying psychology becomes at once a candidate to accept the reasonableness of communism. As every chair of psychology in the United States is occupied by persons in our connection, or who can be influenced by persons in our connection, the consistent employment of such texts is guaranteed. They are given the authoritative ring, and they are carefully taught. Constant pressure in the legislatures of the United States can bring about legislation to the effect that every student attending a high school or university must have classes in psychology. Educating broadly the educated strata of the populace into the tenets of communism is thus rendered relatively easy, and when the choice is given them whether to continue in a capitalistic or communistic condition, they will see suddenly, in communism, much more reasonability than in capitalism, which will now be of our own definition. Chapter 12. Violent Remedies As populaces in general understand that a violence is necessary in the handling of the insane, violent remedies seem to be reasonable. Starting from a relatively low level of violence, such as straitjackets and other restraints, it is relatively easy to encroach upon the public diffidence for violence by adding more and more cruelty into the treatment of the insane. By increasing the brutality of, quote, treatment, unquote, the public expectance of such treatment will be assisted and the protest of the individual to whom the treatment is given is impossible, since immediately after the treatment he is incapable. The family of the individual under treatment is suspect for having had in its midst already an insane person. The family's protest should be discredited. The more violent the treatment, the more command value the psychopolitical operative will accumulate. Brain operations should become standard and commonplace, while the figures of actual deaths should be repressed wherever possible. Nevertheless, it is of no great concern to the psychopolitical operative that many deaths do occur. Gradually, the public should be educated into electric shock, first by believing that it is very therapeutic, then by believing that it is quieting, then by being informed that electric shock usually injures the spine and teeth, and finally that it very often kills or at least breaks the spine and removes violently the teeth of the patient. It is very doubtful if anyone from the lay levels of the public could tolerate the observation of a single electric shock treatment. Certainly they could not tolerate witnessing a prefrontal lobotomy or, transorbal or transorbital leucotomy. However, they should be brought up to a level where this is possible, where it is the expected treatment, and where the details of the treatment itself can be made known, thus to the increase of psychopolitical prestige. The more violent the treatment, the more hopeless insanity will seem to be. The society should be worked up to the level where every... The society should be worked up to the level where every recalcitrant young man can be brought into court and assigned to a psychopolitical operative, be given electric shocks and reduced into unimaginative docility for the remainder of his days. By continuous and increasing advertising of the violence of treatment, the public will at last come to tolerate the creation of zombie conditions to such a degree that they will probably employ zombies if given to them. Uh, 
Thus a large strata of the society, particularly that which was rebellious, can be reduced to the service of the psychopolitician. By various means, a public must be convinced, at least, that insanity can only be met by shock, torture, deprivation, defamation, discreditation, discredit discreditation, violence, maiming, death, punishment in all its forms. The society, at the same time, must be educated into the belief of increasing insanity within its ranks. This creates an emergency and places the psychopolitician in a savior role and places him at length in charge of the society. Chapter 13. The Recruiting of Psychopolitical Dupes the psychopolitical dupe is a well-trained individual who serves in complete obedience the psychopolitical operative, in that nearly all persons in training are expected to undergo a certain amount of treatment in any field of the mind. It is not too difficult to persuade persons in the field of mental healing to subject themselves to mild or minor drugs or shock. If this can be done, a psychological dupe on the basis of pain drug hypnosis can immediately result. Recruitment into the ranks of, quote, mental healing, unquote, can best be done by carefully bringing to it only those healing students who are to some slight degree already depraved, or who have been treated by psychopolitical operatives. Recruitment is affected by making the field of mental healing very attractive financially and sexually. The amount of promiscuity which can be induced in mental patients can work definitely to the advantage of the psychopolitical recruiting agent. The dupe can thus be induced into many lurid sexual contacts, and these, properly witnessed, can thereafter be used as blackmail material to assist any failure of pain drug hypnosis in causing him to execute orders. The promise of unlimited sexual opportunities, the promise of complete dominion over the bodies and minds of helpless patients, the promise of complete lawlessness without detection can thus attract to, quote, mental healing, unquote, many desirable recruits who will willingly fall in line with psychopolitical activities. In that the psycho politician has under his control the insane of the nation most of them have criminal tendencies and as he can as his movement goes forward recruit for his ranks the criminals themselves he has unlimited numbers of human beings to employ on whatever project he may see fit in that the insane will execute destructive projects without question if given the proper amount of punishment and implantation, the degradation of the country's youth, the defamation of its leaders, the suborning of its courts becomes childishly easy. The psychopolitician has the advantage of naming as a delusory symptom any attempt on the part of a patient to expose command. The psychopolitician should carefully adhere to institutions and should eschew private practice whenever possible, since this gives him the greatest number of human beings to control to the use of communism. When he does act in private practice, it should be only in contact with the families of the wealthy and the officials of the country. Chapter 14. The Smashing of Religious Groups you must know that until recent times the complete subject of mental derangement, whether so light as simple worry or so heavy as insanity, was the sphere of activity of the church, and only the church. Traditionally, in civilized nations and barbaric ones, the priesthood alone had in complete charge the mental condition of the citizen. As a matter of great concern to the psychopolitician, this tendency still exists in every public in the Western world, and scientific inroads into this sphere has occurred only in official and never in public quarters. The magnificent tool wielded for, welded for us by Wundt 
would be as nothing if it were not for official insistence in civilized countries that, quote, scientific practices be applied to the problem of the mind. Without this official insistence, or even if it relapsed for a moment, the masses would grasp stupidity for the priest, the minister, the clergy when mental condition came in question. Today in Europe and America, scientific practices in the field of the mind would not last moments if not enforced entirely by officialdom. It must be carefully hidden that the incidence of insanity has increased only since these, quote, scientific practices, unquote, were applied. Great remarks must be made of the pace of modern living and other myths as the cause of the increased neurosis in the world. It is nothing to us what causes it if anything does. It is everything to us that no evidence of any kind shall be tolerated afoot to permit the public tendency toward the church its way. If given their heads, if left to themselves to decide... Independent of officialdom, where they would place their deranged loved ones, the public would choose religious sanitariums and would avoid as if plagued places where scientific practices prevail. And would avoid as if plagued places where, quote, scientific practices, unquote, prevail. Given any slightest encouragement, the public support would swing on an instant all mental healing into the hands of the churches, and there are churches waiting to receive it, clever churches. That terrible monster, the Roman Catholic Church, still dominates mental healing heavily throughout the Christian world, and their well-schooled priests are always at work to turn the public their way. Among fundamentalist and Pentecostal groups, healing campaigns are conducted which, because of their results, win many to the cult of Christianity. In the field of pure healing, the Church of Christ Science of Boston, Massachusetts, excels in commanding the public favor and operates many sanitariums. All these must be swept aside. They must be ridiculed and defamed, and every cure they advertise must be asserted as a hoax. A full fifth of a psychopolitician's time should be devoted to smashing these threats. Just as in Russia we had to destroy, after many, many years of the most arduous work, the church, so we must destroy all faiths in nations marked for conquest. Insanity must be made to hound the footsteps of every priest and practitioner, and his best results must be turned to jabbering insanities no matter what means we have to use. You need not care what effect you have upon the public. The effect you care about is the one upon officials. You must recruit every agency of the nation marked for slaughter into a foaming hatred of religious healing. You must suborn district attorneys and judges into an intense belief as fervent as an ancient faith in God that Christian science or any other religious practice which might devote itself to mental healing is vicious, bad, insanity-causing publicly hated and intolerable. You must suborn and recruit any medical healing organization into collusion in this campaign. You must appeal to their avarice and even their humanity to invite their cooperation in smashing all religious healing and thus, to our end, care of the insane. You must see that such societies have only qualified communist indoctrinees as their advisers in this matter. For you can use such societies. They are stupid and stampede easily. Their cloak and degrees can be used quite well to mask any operation we care to have masked. We must make them partners in our endeavor so that they will never be able to crawl from beneath our thumb and discredit us. We have battled in America since the century's turn to bring to nothing any and all Christian influences, and we are succeeding. While we today seem to be kind to the Christian, remember we have yet to influence the, quote, Christian world, unquote, to our ends. When that is done, we shall have an end of them everywhere. You may see them here in Russia as trained apes. They do not know their tether is long, 
only until the apes in other lands have become unwary. You must work until religion is synonymous with, quote, insanity, unquote. You must work until the officials of city, county, and state governments will not think twice before they pounce upon religious groups as public enemies. Remember, remember all lands are governed by the few and only pretend to consult with the many. It is no different in America. The petty official, the maker of laws alike, can be made to believe the worst. It is not necessary to convince the masses. It is only necessary to work incessantly upon the official, using personal defamations, wild lies, false evidences, and constant propaganda to make him fight for you against the church or against any practitioner. Like the official, the bona fide medical healer also believes the worst if it can be shown to him as dangerous competition. And like the Christian, should he seek to take from us any right we have gained, we shall finish him as well. You must be like the vine upon the tree. We use the tree to climb and then, strangling it, grow into power on the nourishment of its flesh. We must strike from our path any opposition. We must use for our tools any authority that comes to hand. And then, at last, the decades sped, we can dispense with all authority save our own and triumph in the greater glory of the party. Chapter 15. Proposals which must be avoided. There are certain damaging movements which could interrupt a psychopolitical conquest. These, coming from some quarters of the country, might gain headway and should be spotted before they do, and stamped out. Proposals may be made by large and powerful groups in the country to return the insane to the care of those who have handled mental healing for tribes and populaces for centuries, the priest. Any movement to place clergymen in charge of institutions should be fought on the grounds of incompetence and the insanity brought about by religion. The most destructive thing which could happen to a psychopolitical program would be the investment of the ministry with the care of the nation's insane. If mental hospitals operated by religious groups are in existence, they must be discredited and closed, no matter what the cost, for it might occur that the actual figures of recovery in such institutions would become known, and that the lack of recovery in general institutions might be compared to them, and this might lead to a movement to place the clergy in charge of the insane." Every argument must be advanced early to overcome any possibility of this ever occurring. A country's law must carefully be made to avoid any rights of person to the insane. Any suggested laws or constitutional amendments which make the harming of the insane unlawful should be fought to the extreme on the grounds that only violent measures can succeed. If the law were to protect the insane, as it normally does not, the entire psychopolitical program would very possibly collapse. Any movement to increase or place under surveillance the orders required to hospitalize the mentally ill should be discouraged. This should be left entirely in the hands of persons well under the control of psychopolitical operatives. It should be done with minimum formality, and no recovery of the insane from an institution should be possible by any process of law. Thus, any movement to add to the legal steps of the processes of commitment and release should be discouraged on the grounds of emergency. To obviate this, the best action is to, place a is to place a psychiatric and detention ward for the mentally ill in every hospital in a land. Any writings of a psychopolitical nature accidentally disclosing themselves should be prevented. All actual literature on the subject of insanity and its treatment should be suppressed, first by actual security and second by complex verbiage which renders it incomprehensible. 
The actual figures of recovery or death should never be announced in any papers. Any investigation attempting to discover whether or not psychiatry or psychology has ever cured anyone should immediately be discouraged and laughed to scorn and should mobilize at that point all psychopolitical operatives. At first it should be ignored, but if this is not possible, the entire weight of all psychopoliticians in the nation should be pressed into service. Any tactic possible should be employed to prevent this from occurring. To rebut it, technical appearing papers should exist as to the tremendous number of cures affected by psychiatry and psychology, and whenever possible, percentages of cures, no matter how fictitious, should be worked into legislative papers, thus forming a background of evidence which would immediately rebut any effort to actually discover anyone who had ever been helped by psychiatry or psychology. If the communistic connections of a psychopolitician should become disclosed, it should be attributed to his own carelessness, and he should himself be immediately branded as eccentric within his own profession. Authors of literature which seek to demonstrate the picture of a society under complete mental control and duress should be helped toward infamy or suicide to discredit their works. Any legislation liberalizing any healing practice should be immediately fought and defeated. All healing practices should gravitate entirely to authoritative levels, and no other opinion should be admitted, as these might lead to exposure. Movements to improve youth should be invaded and corrupted, as this might interrupt campaigns to produce in youth delinquency, addiction, drunkenness, and sexual promiscuity. Communist workers in the field of newspapers and radio should be protected wherever possible by striking out of action through psychopolitics any persons consistently attacking them. These, in their turn, should be persuaded to give every possible publicity to the benefits of psychopolitical activities under the heading of, quote, science, unquote. No healing group devoted to the mind must be allowed to exist within the borders of Russia or its satellites. Only well-vouched-for psychopolitical operatives can be continued in their practice, and this only for the benefit of the government or against enemy prisoners. Any effort to exclude psychiatrists or psychologists from the armed services must be fought. Any inquest into the, quote, suicide, unquote, or sudden mental derangement of any political leader in a nation must be conducted only by psychopolitical operatives or their dupes, whether psychopolitics is responsible or not. Death and violence against persons attacking communism in a nation should be eschewed as forbidden. Violent activity against such persons might bring about their martyrdom. Defamation and the accusation of insanity alone should be employed and they should be brought at last under the ministrations of psychopolitical operatives such as psychiatrists and controlled psychologists. Chapter 16 in Summary in this time of unlimited weapons and in national antagonisms where atomic war with capitalistic powers is possible, psychopolitics must act efficiently as never before. Any and all programs of psychopolitics must be increased to aid and abet the activities of other communist agents throughout the nation in question. The failure of psychopolitics might well bring about the atomic bombing of the motherland. If psychopolitics succeeds in its mission throughout the capitalistic nations of the world, there will never be an atomic war, for Russia will have subjugated all of her enemies. Communism is already spread across one-sixth of the inhabited world. Marxist doctrines have already penetrated the remainder. An extension of the communist social order is everywhere victorious. 
the spread of communism has never been by force of battle, but by conquest of the mind. In psychopolitics, we have refined this conquest to its last degree. The psychopolitical operative must succeed, for his success means a world of peace. His failure might well mean the destruction of the civilized portions of Earth by atomic power in the hands of capitalistic madmen. The end thoroughly justifies the means. The degradation of populaces is less inhuman than their destruction by atomic fission, for to an animal who lives only once, all life is sweeter than death. The end of war is the control of a conquered people. If people can be conquered in the absence of war, the end of war will have been achieved without the destruction of war. A worthy goal. The psychopolitician has his reward in the nearly unlimited control of populaces, in the uninhibited exercise of passion and the glory of communist conquest over the stupidity of the enemies of the people. The End <laughs>